Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We have part 2, looking at uh, verses 17 through 40. Part 2 of our study of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, Living by Faith. Sometimes people will say to me, Pastor Tim, I don't think the Old Testament is really all that important. I mean, we're under the New Covenant, right? We don't really need to know what's the Old Testament all about. The problem with that is, if you don't know how the Bible starts, you're not going to understand how the Bible ends. If you don't know about why we need a Savior, you're, you're going to miss the whole book. Genesis tells us that we fell from perfection, and the rest of the Bible is telling us about God redeeming us. If you don't read the book of Genesis... You're not going to understand why there's so many languages in the world. Or why we wear clothes for that matter. Or why marriage is between a man and a woman. So there's so, so much there in the Old Testament that's foundational uh, that the New Testament references. And I remember one person about a year ago who told me uh, they didn't want to read the Old Testament. And I encouraged them and in essence challenged them to read the book of Hebrews and see how much of it made sense to them without understanding the Old Testament. Because so much of this book is rooted in the Old Testament. And we see that especially in Hebrews chapter 11. That it points us back to the men and women of faith who were the Old Testament saints. And really they are examples of faith to help us. Because so often we can feel discouraged. We can feel, well, like I'm not really someone really that important. I'm not someone really special. And yet, as you take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, you realize that God uses ordinary men and women to do extraordinary things. And that should encourage us. And that's my hope as we take a look at God's word this morning, is that this would encourage us as we take a look at their demonstration of their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, we'll take a look at four sections. The first is we'll take a look at the patriarchs, the fathers of the faith. And we'll see their faith was tested in verses 17 through 22. Next, we'll take a look at Moses and see that his faith was enduring in verses 23 through 29. Uh, We'll take a look at Joshua and Rahab and we'll see that their faith was winning in verses 30 and 31. And then lastly, we'll look at uh, more heroes of the faith. And we'll see their faith was surviving in verses 32 through 40. So with that, let's take a look at the faith of the patriarchs here in verses 17 through 22. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, And Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. We'll pause there. The first man we see mentioned here is Abraham. And it's very interesting here in verse 17. It says that when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. And uh, it says, his only begotten son. Now, if you haven't read the account in Genesis, you would think, okay, so he had one son. But if you've read Genesis, you know that he had another son. Uh, He had a son of the flesh. In a moment of weakness, uh, as human as we all are, uh, he took some bad advice 
and he had relations with his wife's maidservant, Hagar, and she conceived and gave birth to a son named Ishmael. And Ishmael is, uh, we know him as the father of the Arab nations today. And uh, in fact, the contentions today exist between the descendants of Isaac, the Hebrews, the Jewish people, uh, Israel, and the descendants of Ishmael, the Arab people. Uh, we would say those who are Ishmaelites. Uh, they are in strife with one another. In fact, if you look at Israel on the map, all the nations around them <laughs> want to destroy them. And so there are tensions there today, and partly through Abraham's disobedience. Um, but we see that that's not mentioned here at all in this hall of faith. And I love that because it's a reminder that God forgives our sins as we believe in him, as we put our faith and trust in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, again, anytime we try and fulfill God's promises on our own, we fail. It does not work out great. Uh, we don't want to try and fulfill the promises of God in our flesh. We should just trust the Lord to fulfill it in His way. So, God was testing Abraham's obedience and his faith. And He never intended for Isaac to actually be sacrificed. In fact, if you go back and read Genesis 22, and I highly encourage you to do so, you will see that Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. And that's what we see here in verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. In Genesis 22, Abraham told his servants, The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will return to you. Not I will return to you, but we will return to you. Abraham at this point knew that he could trust the Lord. It's one thing to have a moment of weakness in your faith. It's another thing to see God fulfill his promise. And you're about 100 years old and you have a child. And your wife is about 90-ish. And she gives birth way beyond the time that is really healthy to have kids and really possible to have kids. It's a miracle. So Abraham knew that with God, all things are possible. And he believed, Lord, somehow you're going to fulfill your promise that through my son, Isaac, all the nations are going to be blessed. You told that to me, and now you're going to do that through my son. If that's true, you're going to have to raise my child from the dead. You're going to have to do this somehow, some way. So Abraham believed that God could fulfill his promise. Now what's also fascinating in Genesis 22 is it's the first use of the word love. It's the love of the only begotten. It's a love for your son. It's a love of a father affectionately loving his son. And it's a beautiful picture of what we see in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son, whom he loved so much, to die on the cross for our sins, right? That we could have everlasting life and not perish. We simply believe and trust in him. So through this love, we see a divine love in the heavens between the Father and the Son. And a love for us, wanting us to enjoy that love relationship with uh, the triune God that we worship. So Abraham believed the Lord and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now, God told Abraham again that he was going to have many descendants through Isaac. And so Abraham believed the Lord. He believed that God would raise Isaac up in order to keep his promise. And it was such faith of Abraham. Now what's also fascinating in Genesis 22 is that this is the same mountain range that Jesus later ascended 
carrying wood on his back. And uh, it points us to the fact that Isaac was not sacrificed. If you haven't read the account, go back and read it. You'll see that Abraham, as he had the knife in his hand, was about to sacrifice, was stopped by an angel of the Lord and was told uh, to, to let him go. And there was a ram caught in the thicket, a male lamb that was sacrificed instead. And it points us to Jesus Christ. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus became our substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. And he carried the wood on his back on that same mountain. And the knife that was in his hand, in Abraham's hand, points us to the spear that pierced Jesus' side. It points us to the nails and the spikes that went through his hands and through his feet. And the fire, in essence, is a picture of the torment and, and the little, almost we could say, hell that Jesus went through on the cross for our sake. And so we see this picture in Genesis 22 pointing us to the reality of we have everything that we have in Jesus Christ. So through Abraham's faith, we see it was tested. And again, you've heard me see this before. Um, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Now, it's not that Abraham didn't know the Lord and didn't know that if the Lord could be trusted. No, he knew the Lord and he had faith in the Lord. This test wasn't to see if God knew what was going on in Abraham's heart. It was a test to reveal what was going on in Abraham's heart. God knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows our the thoughts and intents of our heart. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's God. So it's not like God was trying to figure out, Abraham, do you still love me? He knew already. What he was doing was showing Abraham, revealing to Abraham uh, where he is at in his faith walk with the Lord. And sometimes God does that to us. And it reveals where we're at in the Lord. And it, it can be encouraging to realize that, you know what? I'm not the person I used to be. If I had been tested 10 years ago in this trial, I would have totally blown up on that person. But because the Lord is maturing me and growing me, wow, Lord, you are changing and transforming me. And, and, and it, I can see that you are at work in my life. And so, again, a faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. Our faith, our trust, our confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the next one we see here is Isaac in verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, if you go back and read the account of Isaac, you may not really know him as a spiritual man. Uh, but he is a spiritual man because he's listed here in the Hall of Faith. Because he had a prophetic blessing that he pronounced upon his sons. And it's a very fascinating account if you go back and read. Uh, you read about his birth. You read about his binding. You read about him uh, finding a bride. You read about him getting old and getting blind. And then you read about him blessing uh, the kids with, with uh, a birthright. And how there was this switcheroo that, that happened. And so very fascinating if you take a look at his life. But we really see what he's here in the Hall of Faith for is concerning the blessing of his kids. Of things to come. It's a reminder that sometimes we need to remember that there are things to come yet in the future that God is going to fulfill. And that's what he had his promises in, were things that were yet to come. Well, we see in verse 21, the faith of Jacob. When he was dying, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Jacob claimed Joseph's two sons as his own, thereby giving the double portion the birthright to Joseph. Now, this is fascinating because this is the same one 
who cheated out his brother um, to get the blessing, to get the birthright from his father Isaac. And if you don't know the story, you got to go back and read it, how Isaac was uh, getting blinded, he was old, and um, mom got involved in this kind of switcheroo and pretending to be the brother, and um, really, in essence, robbing us of seeing how the Lord was going to fulfill his promise. Um, nevertheless, God did bless Jacob, the younger. And what's fascinating is that when Jacob was older, when Joseph, after he had been betrayed by his brothers and, and Joseph was in uh, Egypt, uh, we see that um, God had sent Joseph ahead of time in Egypt to rescue and redeem his family. So Jacob goes to Egypt and he's an older man at this point, and he blesses Jacob's sons. Now, what's fascinating, if you read this, Joseph brought his sons in a certain order up to his father. However, at the very last minute, Jacob switched his arms. He crossed his arms to bless the younger over the older. And I think it's fascinating because so often we see that in the Bible, that God does things differently than we would always uh, be accustomed to. You see, in the culture, the older son would receive the blessing, the birthright, because when the father passed on, it became his primary responsibility to look out for the family. He was to take care of everyone else. So he would get a double portion of the inheritance. However, we see that with Jacob, and we see that with Joseph's son, that Ephraim received the blessing. That, J that Jacob blessed Joseph's son, and he put his hand on Ephraim to bless him. And truly, we see later on, the tribe of Ephraim was greater than that of the tribe of Manasseh. So, again, fascinating. You can go back in the book of Genesis and read the account uh, we see that this is pointing us to the blessing as uh, he worshipped and was leaning on the top of his staff. Well, verse 22, by faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel, gave instructions concerning his bones. Joseph, when he was an old man and was dying, he asked that his bones be returned to a land that was going to be promised, the promised land, when the children of Israel finally returned. He believed someday they would leave Egypt and live as a nation in the land God had given to them. He believed what he heard from his father and the grandfather and the great-grandfather, that a land had been promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph believed it by faith. And so about 400 years later, when the children of Israel finally left Egypt, they were obedient and they took the bones of Joseph with them. So Joseph, by faith, looked ahead, knowing that there was going to be a deliverance. Now, again, it's so fascinating that we see these men of faith, these patriarchs, these fathers of the faith, that their faith was tested. And it's really for our benefit that we see uh, how they endured that trial. It should be encouraging to us as well. Well, next we move on from covering the book of Genesis, and we cover the book of Exodus. And we take a look at the faith of Moses in verses 23 through 29. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. 
By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. In verse 23, we're reminded about the birth of Moses. And when he was about three months old, we see that his parents uh, defied Pharaoh's directive. They did not throw Moses into the Red Sea. Or excuse me, not the Red Sea, but the, the, um, the Nile River. And uh, what's fascinating is that it says here that he was a beautiful child. Really that he was a special child. They knew that God had a plan and a purpose for his life. And I think as parents, we need to have that same mindset that God has a plan and a special purpose for each of our children. They are special and unique. And God's got something in mind for them. Another thing I see here is that as Christians, we are to obey the laws of the land unless they are in conflict with God's laws. Then we must obey God rather than man. We must not go against our conscience and God's word. We must obey God rather than man. And we see as Moses grew up in the palace of Egypt, that he rejected the possible rulership in Egypt. He chose to join the children of Israel and their difficulties. You know, Moses could have enjoyed all the riches of living in the palace. He wasn't born there, but he was in essence adopted through Pharaoh's daughter as he came out of the Nile River and into the household. So Moses really valued the worst aspect of the godly life more than the best the world had to offer. He chose God's riches rather than the pleasures and the riches of Egypt. Again, adopted as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Moses quite possibly could have eventually become the king of Egypt. But he knew by faith that God's promises were far greater and he believed them. So Moses looked forward. He looked to the reward as we see in the end of verse 26. He looked to the reward in the heavenly. Now, Moses lived about 1,500 years before Christ. But even at this early date, he knew about the promised Messiah. And if you've read about the life of Moses, you've, you've probably seen this. And one clear example is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 15 through 19. Moses says that, one would be coming after him, a prophet like him, who is greater, pointing us to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Moses knew God's eternal promises that were given to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And he saw that those were far more valuable than the temporary riches that people could offer. So he chose the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He looked to the reward. It's a good reminder to us that we also need to look to the reward. We need to look to heaven. We need to look to what we have in Jesus Christ. We need to look ahead. And we see in verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Well, Moses at first tried to deliver the children of Israel on his own. He tried to do it in the flesh. He saw that there was an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He went to go break up the fight. He then killed the Egyptian, tried to hide him. And the ground possibly covering him in sand or something like that. Uh, somebody saw him. And uh, as he saw two Hebrews the next day fighting. 
try to stop them. And one of them said, are you going to kill us as you killed the Egyptian the other day? He freaked out because he knew that the king, the pharaoh, would be after him and he fled. Now, it's a reminder to us that even when we think nobody else is watching us, God is always watching us. <laughs> we can't hide anything from him. So Moses fled and he went to the land of Midian. Uh, he fled from Egypt. And uh, he, he learned a lot in the desert. Um, J. Vernon McGee, who was a, a, was a southern pastor who's now uh, gone to be with the Lord, kind of a country preacher, if you will, uh, he used to say that Moses earned the back of the desert degree. Forty years in the desert, tending sheep. That's a long time. He had to unlearn a lot of things. Sometimes we want to be used by the Lord now. And we have to learn patience like Moses. Forty years. Hopefully it doesn't take us forty years to learn the lessons Moses learned. Eventually, there's the burning bush and, and God brings uh, Moses back to come uh, to the people and through Aaron as well to help deliver the people. And uh, they, they flee uh, Egypt through these miraculous things that God does. But he uh, feared the wrath of the king and he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses believed in what his eyes couldn't see. He believed in the invisible God. Now, Jesus said that those of us who believe and yet have not seen him are blessed. In fact, in essence, we're more blessed than disciples that physically saw Jesus, that touched him, that handled him, that heard him, that ate with him. We are blessed because we believe in something invisible that we can't see. But we know what's true. Just as we believe in heaven, we haven't seen it, but yet we know what's true because the scriptures tell us so. So it's a reminder that the men of faith always see more than those who rely on their natural intellect. Seeing the physical is easy because the world around us However, seeing the spiritual takes spiritual eyes. Like those we've seen listed here in the Hall of Faith, we need to remember there's a real spiritual realm around us. There are angels around us. There's a real heaven awaiting for us. To, again, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, eventually God uses uh, Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. There's these ten plagues, these, these ten judgments on Egypt. The last one is the, the death of the firstborn. And so uh, God makes a provision that they're to take a lamb, a spotless, unblemished lamb, no broken bones, no deformities, uh, it was supposed to be a, a perfect lamb. And they were to take the blood of that lamb and apply it to the doorposts and the lintel of their house, the, the frame of their house, of the, their door frames. And in essence, as they were making uh, uh, that provision, as they were applying the lamb's blood to their door, they were in essence making a cross as they were applying that. And it's interesting because... Uh, the angel of death who would be flying over all of Egypt looking for those houses that had the blood on the doors would pass over them. And it's a picture that points us to the reality of what we have in Christ. As Jesus, the Lamb of God who was, died for our sins, his blood has been shed on the cross for us. As we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, his blood has been spiritually applied to the doors of our heart. And so too the angel of death will pass over us. Now we'll uh, die, this body will cease, it, it'll give out. 
But spiritually, we will never die. We will be passed over. We will go straight to be with the Lord. Again, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So we will not experience the second death, which is eternal separation from God. No, we will be with our God forever and ever and ever. So the Passover points us to Jesus, the Lamb of God. And we see that God had delivered the people uh, from Egypt. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea in verse 29 by dry land. Whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Now, there's an interesting correlation here between Moses' first time to try and deliver the children of Israel and when God delivered the children of Israel. Moses, on his own attempt, in his flesh, could not even bury one Egyptian properly. Yet God, in his supernatural ability, was able to bear the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. So you can do it man's way, or you can do it God's way. Better to do it God's way. Now it's fascinating, if you go back and read this account, and I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, I was doing this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's very intriguing. Uh, it says that as they were crossing the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptians were pursuing them, that God began to kind of mess with them a little bit. He was taking their wheels off their chariots, and he was making sure that there was no way they were going to hurt his children. And so there they were, stuck, as God had Moses lift up his staff again, and the Red Sea came crashing on the, all of the Egyptian army, thus drowning them. So God's way is better. Uh, we should let the Lord handle his battles. The victory belongs to the Lord. The battle is his. Now, we see that by faith, the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. And again, on dry land. That's a miracle in and of itself. But we also see that um, they followed Moses into the wilderness. And our lives inspire other people to trust God or distrust him. God sometimes allows us to hit rock bottom or to be between a rock and a hard place where, where we have really nowhere to look but up. You know, like Moses and the children of Israel, they were between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army. And they did the only thing there's left to do, right? Panic. <laughs> no, the, pray. Uh, so often we get that same situation. There's a closed door and a closed door. And we say, Lord, I'm panicking. Help, what do I do? And it's in those moments we need to pray. We need to seek God. We need to trust Him. We need to walk in His ways and seek His will. And so like Moses, we need to stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. We need to watch the Lord work and then go forward in faith. We must, like Moses, be active by praying and then rely upon the Lord. It's a faith that endures. It's a faith that keeps going. It's a faith that keeps trusting in the Lord. Even when it seems impossible. Even when it seems like, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I'm going to open up the Red Sea. Oh, didn't know that. <laughs> that works. So it's a faith that just believes and wholeheartedly trusts in the Lord. It's a faith that reminds me of what we see in the New Testament, uh, where Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. It had never been done before. <laughs> now, he did not get his eyes off the Lord and begin to drown and sink, but hey, he's the only one that got out of the boat and walked on the water. Pretty cool. So, again, with God, all things are possible, and we want to have the faith that endures as we, as we walk with him and look to him and trust in him. Well, next we move from covering the book of Exodus through Joshua and then eventually the rest of the Old Testament. And we take a look at that. Uh, we take a look at how their faith overcame in verses 30 through verse 40. Verse 30, we see, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. 
By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weaknesses were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony, through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Well, the first thing we see here is Joshua and Rahab in verses 30 and 31. Now, God had promised Joshua uh, that he was going to be the leader in charge after Moses. And you can imagine Joshua uh, trying to figure out how to lead the people, knowing that he would never be like Moses. No one could be like Moses. And yet he knew that God had called him to be the leader, to be in charge of his people, to lead them into the promised land. That's some big shoes to fill and a lot of responsibility that was now resting on his shoulders. And so as they departed, uh, the Jordan River was in front of them and the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant. As soon as their feet touched the edge of the river, the river parted. They were able to walk across through the Jordan River on dry ground. And as it's a reminder, yes, the Lord is with us. Joshua is the one who was called to lead us into the promised land. We're going to be okay. God is present. God is working here. Now, Joshua still needed some of that reinsurance. You can imagine that he is in charge of the Lord's people and some very sharp generals and commanders and people in uh, the service there uh, who wanted to go and do a battle to start winning these victories for the Lord. And Joshua goes and and has some quiet time with the Lord in essence. He, He goes off by himself and he encounters the angel of the Lord. And he asks a very interesting question. He says, are you for us or are you against us? And the angel of the Lord says, neither. I am the commander of the Lord's army and I have been sent here. (laughs) At that point, Joshua realized, okay, I asked the wrong question. (laughs) What I really need to be doing is making sure I'm on your side. So often as Christians, we ask the Lord, Lord, are you okay with what I'm about to do? Or are you against with what I'm about to do? Are you for me, Lord? Or are you against me? The question we need to be asking is, Lord, am I on your side? Am I walking with you? Am I allowing you to be the commander? Or am I trying to take charge? And as soon as we allow the Lord to be in the driver's seat, as soon as we allow him to be the commander, then we realize the Lord is fighting the battle. 
we're going to be victorious because the battle belongs to the Lord. And so we see that Joshua realized this. And it's also interesting that God had promised Joshua that every place that he would put his foot in the promised land would be his. So the people followed Joshua by faith. And there would be a great victory over the the city of Jericho, demonstrating that God was not confined to the logical ways of doing things. And I can't imagine Joshua going back and going to the generals and going to his people and and um, they're saying, all right, what's the game plan? What's the battle plan? What's the strategy? What are we going to do? We're going to march around the city. And maybe they're thinking, great, we're going to spy it out and kind of see what's going on. We're not going to say anything. We're just going to walk around. Okay, great. What are we going to do the next day? We're going to do it again and again and again for six days. <laughs> and then the seventh day, we're going to go around a few times, several times. And then we're going to have the priests use their trumpets. And then we're all going to yell. And God's going to win for us. The walls are going to collapse. Well, that takes a lot of faith. <laughs> That's a lot of trust. And we see that they had uh, trust that, okay, Lord, you're speaking through Joshua. We're going to trust that, that somehow, some way, you're going to do this. And there they did it. They marched around the city. And we know that on that last day, they blew the trumpets and they shouted and the walls came down. Now, what's fascinating, it actually says that the walls came down and that the children of Israel went in and up to the city. And what's intriguing about that is if you go to Israel today, you'll see that there was actually an outer wall and an inner wall. And the inner wall was actually shorter than the outer wall. And as the outer wall fell down, it rested right on that inner wall and it made the perfect ramp right into the city, which fits perfectly with the biblical account. They went in and then up. So God had provided a way for his people to go right into the city. Uh, it was a perfect uh, provision and providence of the Lord to enter the city. And we see really three things here. Uh, through the faith of the children of Israel and Joshua to defeat Jericho. The first was they were obedient. Because they didn't understand what they were about to do and why they were going to march around the city, but they were obedient. The second thing we see is that they were patient. Because the walls didn't found, did not fall down the first day or the second day or the third day. They fell down on the seventh day. They had to march around. They had to be patient. As the Lord works. Again, it's a reminder to us to be patient as the Lord does his work. And the third is anticipating because they knew God would act on the seventh day when they shouted. They believed by faith that the Lord was going to come through. And it's the same thing that we need to have. We need to have this kind of faith to claim victory in our life, to walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings. And sometimes, again, not by logic, but to walk by faith in the Lord. Now, before Moses departed, he had sent 12 spies into the land of Israel, uh, into the promised land. And two came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb. Now, Joshua sent some people into the land to spy it out as well. He didn't send 12, he didn't send 10, he didn't send 5, he sent 2. Perhaps he learned from the previous lesson. So he sent a couple guys into Jericho. And they came to a house of a prostitute named Rahab. Now what's fascinating is that uh, they didn't know this, but the Lord was already working in that city. And Rahab was one who had a fear of the Lord. She had a reverence and respect and an awe for, the, the, for God. She had heard about how the children of Israel had crossed through the Red Sea, how the Egyptians had been killed, how they had also defeated Og and Bashan, and, and how God was, was doing these victories, these battles uh, for these children of Israel. And she knew that her city would be destroyed. 
And so moved with fear, moved with love for her and her family, she told the spies, before you leave, before I send you out of the city, promise me that you will not allow me to be killed. Spare my life. Spare the life of my family. And we see that they made an agreement with her that she would to be hanging this red strand cord out of her window and that they would not destroy her home, that all in her home would be saved. Now again, what's fascinating, if you get a chance to go to Israel and you can go to the city of Jericho, there's one section of the wall that is intact. Now it's not perfectly standing up like a modern wall, but you can see all the rocks are there. All the pieces are in that area where the rest of it, a lot of it, is has been destroyed over time um, by the elements and such. But this one area is very well intact. And it's fascinating because it's the exact area where Rahab would have been. Again, her dwelling was on the out was on the edge of the town. It was on that wall. So Rahab. Uh, believed that the Lord was going to come and, and she was moved with fear um, to to basically save her own life and the life of her family. And when we take a look at how God used Rahab to help the spies, it demonstrates three things. First, it demonstrates the sovereignty of God because he chose Rahab and her family out of the people of Jericho. The second thing that I see here is the grace of God because he chose Rahab despite her profession. And I love that because it's a reminder to us that God does not throw away people. Perhaps there are those in this world that we say, well, that person has chosen a profession that is immoral. They've done things that are completely uh, just gross. God would never want to use that person. Wrong. God can redeem anyone. And we see the grace of God and the life of Rahab here. The third thing we see is her faith in God. She truly believed that God could save her and her family. In fact, we see God did save her and her family. And that faith came true. So Rahab believed in the reports she had heard about the children of Israel and their God. And by faith she believed that they would conquer mighty Jericho. Since the Israelites promised to spare all those in her house, Rahab's house, in essence, became a house of faith. And that red cord hanging from her window represented Christ's blood. And Jesus eventually, as we take a look at the genealogy, descended from Rahab through his mother, Mary. Now again, if you were God, not that you are God, but if you were God, and you had the ability to choose the lineage you were going to come through, wouldn't you want to choose like kings and presidents and pharaohs and people who were rich and successful and had all these things and hospitals you could be born into versus I'm going to come from a lineage that has some skeletons in the closet, some character flaws, um, some professions uh, that were probably not the best professional uh, choices that people made. Yet Jesus chose to come through Rahab. He chose to come through this lineage. Why? Because he came to identify with all people. He came to save all of us from the top to the very, very bottom of all humanity. His heart is to redeem all of mankind. So Jesus eventually comes through the lineage of Rahab through his mother, Mary. Again, we see that their faith was in the Lord, and the Lord uh, was victorious in their lives. Well, verse 32 says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. In essence, he's saying, Man, we could spend all the rest of our time looking at the Old Testament saints, but I'm out of time. <laughs> uh, and I'm probably running out of time as well. But there's so much there in the Old Testament that speaks to us about how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 
In fact, oftentimes God chooses those who lack confidence in their own abilities to do his work because he's made strong in our weaknesses. I truly believe that God often chooses us as well because often we lack confidence because we realize it's the Lord who is strong working in us and through us. You can look at Moses. He said that he wasn't eloquent in speech. In fact, he tried to say, Lord, find someone else. And the Lord said, fine, I'll use Aaron. Your brother can come and help you. You could look at Gideon. He, in essence, fleeced the Lord. Lord, are you with me? Are you not with me? Can you confirm that again? I just want to make sure again, Lord. Lord, I really want to make sure again. So you could look at Gideon. You could look at Isaiah. You could look at Jeremiah. Look at Ezekiel. Uh, They were all feeling inadequate. You could look at even some of Jesus' own disciples. And yet God chose to use them, not because of their abilities, but because of their availability. Because he is made strong in our weaknesses. Again, Gideon, he boldly destroyed the idols. He was mightily used of God to defeat a much larger army than the Midianites. In Judges chapter 6 and 7, God used the mighty 300 uh, to do a, a, a battle uh, that only he would get the glory for. Uh, the battle belongs to the Lord. You look at Barak. Uh, he led the people of Israel into dramatic victory over the Canaanites in Judges chapter 4. Uh, Samson, he was used mightily of God to defeat the Philistines. And no, his strength wasn't in his hair. His strength was in the Lord. And he finally realized that at the end of his life. And hopefully it's a lesson we learn that our strength is not in our ability. Our strength is in the Lord. Take a look at Jephthah. He was used of God to defeat the Ammonites. Uh, David, the great king of Israel, who was a remarkable man of faith. And the Lord used him for many great victories and battles. Uh, Each of these men of faith uh, had also notable areas of failure in their life. Again, fascinating that they're not mentioned here. Because still Hebrews 11 commends their faith, lists them in the hall of faith. Again, this shows that the Lord forgives us of our sins. He forgives our transgressions. It also shows that weak faith is better than no faith. That a little bit of faith is better than unbelief. You don't have to be perfect to make it into God's hall of faith. You just have to have mustard seed faith. And I love that because sometimes that's all we have is mustard seed faith. Lord, I don't have a lot of understanding how this is going to work. But Lord, I trust you. You're going to come through on this. I believe by faith. So again, faith is better than no faith at all. And the Lord will do His work as we simply put our trust in Him. Well, verses 33 and 34 uh, mentions um, how they subdued kingdoms, work righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched violence of fire, skipped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were strong, valiant in battle, Turn to fight armies of the aliens, uh, foreigners. These verses refer to the men of faith listed in verse 32 and to other men of Israel as well. Many of the Old Testament saints won great victories. They received the fulfillment of many divine promises like Daniel, who was able to stop the mouth of lions because there was an angel there that did that work. Yet he, he had revelations of prophecy of things yet to come. Well, others didn't, yet they also had great faith. Sometimes we look at men like Daniel and we think, such a great man of faith, and he truly is a great example for us. But as I've been studying the scriptures, I think sometimes perhaps it takes even greater faith to trust in God when heaven seems silent to our prayers than when he's answering in great victories. When you're not hearing from the Lord, when it feels like, God, where are you in the midst of this? I'm I'm in Babylon. Daniel's gone. And there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're there. And they say, you know what? 
even if we burn in the fire, we will not bow down to you. We believe the Lord can deliver us. But if he can't, we know that his will will be done. I think that takes great faith to have that kind of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to have that faith in the Lord. And we see that these men of faith suffered various punishments at the hand of unbelievers, assuring them their special place in the heavenly kingdom. They went through a lot. There were mockings and scourgings of chains, imprisonments, stonings, sawn in two, tempted, slain with a sword. Um, it's a reminder to us that if we want to be listed in the spiritual hall of faith that's still being written in heaven, there are going to be trials. It doesn't come easy. In fact, the, the reference here to being sawn in two or sawn asunder, according to Jewish tradition, the prophet Isaiah was executed by being sawn in two during the reign of the evil son of King Hezekiah, Manasseh. So they were trusting in the Lord and they weren't always uh, liked by the people. And we see in verse 38, I love this. In fact, I underline this as my, in my Bible and I encourage you to do as well. Of whom the world was not worthy. These are men and women. These are people of faith. Who were pleasing God. Not trying to please the world. It's those who are pleasing God. Who are often displeasing to the world. Sometimes we can be people pleasers. We want to please this group, we want to please this group, we want to please these people. And yet we realize over time, we can't please everyone. We can't please all these groups of people. Better to focus on pleasing the Lord. That's where our striving, our, our aim, our target should be is pleasing the Lord. And as you please the Lord, you'll please some people because they want to follow the Lord. But there will be many who will say, I don't like what you're doing. I don't want to, I don't, you're weird. <laughs> Get away from me. But we would rather please the Lord than be trying to please the world. So if there are people who are displeased with you, yet God is pleased with you, you're in great company. Because that's what happened to the men and women of faith that we see here. Of whom the world was not worthy. And I believe that can be said about you and I as well. That through Christ we are worthy. And because of that, the world is not worthy of the worth and the value that we have in Christ Jesus. If they don't accept and trust in Jesus Christ as well. Well, we see that they wandered all about. And verse 39, all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The members of the hall of faith did not receive the promised Messiah. They looked forward to the Messiah. They believed by faith. They didn't see the Messiah, but they believed that he was going to come. We actually have it better because we look back. We can look back and see the historical evidence for Christ, that he came, that he was real. He suffered and died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood there. He was buried in that tomb. He was really dead. And yet he rose from the dead. They looked forward by faith, believing something that had yet to, ha to happen. We look back by faith knowing that this has happened and that we can trust in Jesus, the promised Messiah. So our relationship with God is even better than theirs was because we are able to approach the Father through the Son. We have direct access now into the Holy of Holies as we've studied through the book of Hebrews. So this summarizes the good report obtained by the elders of our faith. The men and women who put their faith and their trust in the Lord. In closing, uh, I want to remind you that the good news is that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. 
Sometimes we think, Lord, I don't have much to offer you, but here I am. And the Lord says, perfect, I can use that. God wants to use those of us who are willing to be used by him. And then he'll do all the equipping. He'll help us as he calls us. The important thing for you to know is what has God called you to do? Once you figure out the answer to that question, then step out in faith and trust him to equip you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 7 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God wants to do the same in us as well. He calls us, he equips us, he works in us, and he works through us. Again, we look at the Hall of Faith, we look at these men and women, and we realize they were ordinary people, just like you and me. But God can do extraordinary things through them, and he desires to do extraordinary things through our lives as well, as we simply trust in him as we walk by faith. Well, next week we learn how those listed here in chapter 11, the hall of faith can push us and encourage us to finish our race in Jesus Christ and to finish strong. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity to look at your word, to study your word, to be encouraged by the men and women in, in this hall of faith. Lord, we thank you that they looked forward. They looked to you. We thank you for the patriarchs and, and looking how their faith was tested and how they trusted in you. We look at Moses and see how his faith was enduring. We look at Joshua and Rahab and see how their faith was winning. And we look at more of the heroes of the faith here and we see how their faith was surviving. Lord, would you continue to encourage our hearts as so often we can feel discouraged in this world. Lord, help us to walk by faith. And Lord, if you're calling us to do something, help us to take that step of faith, to trust you more than what our eyes can see, to, to take our step outside of our comfort zone into your comfort zone and allow you to help us to be used by you and for you. And Lord, for those this morning who are here who have yet to make that very first step of faith, to put their trust in you, we pray, Lord, that you'd be working on their hearts and that by your spirit, you'd be convicting them of their sin, convincing them of your amazing love for them. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer and meet it in your heart as you say these words to God after me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. I believe that Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, that he died on the cross for my sins. That he shed his blood there for me. That he was buried and rose from the dead. God, I turn from my sin. And I turn to you. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. From all my mistakes. That you'd wash me clean. That you'd make me whiter than snow. God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. And I pray by your spirit, you'd help me from this day forward to follow you 
to walk with you, to walk in your ways. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for being my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name.